we'll just wait for this to come up. Cool. Hello, everyone. Let's try that again. Uh, I think we're uh, we're back in business now. We had a few uh, a few technical problems with Tom not having audio and being a little bit blurry, but he looks much more higher. He looks much higher resolution now, which is a horror to all. <laughs> <laughs> see the crags, the crags on his face. But yeah, we should Sorry. be back in now. If we have any, if you can't hear the audio, um, which hopefully you can. Now, uh, feel free to ping us in the, the chat. We'll be having a look. So, see, so we start again. We just finished the, the panel on the main stage about Roki and uh, holistic storytelling. And we thought it'd be really nice just to jump straight into a live Q&A session, uh, see if anyone had any questions. We've got, we've got some from social media already. Um, yeah, so we'll get started with those. But if you have any questions, we can stick around however long. Uh, just whack them in the chat and we'll we'll get to them. Uh, but first of all, thanks for popping along. I hope you enjoyed the stream. So now that you have audio, Tom, I'll give you your first question. So this is from Machine Boy. And the question was a really good question is, how do you play test? How do you do play testing when making narrative games? It is a really good question. I gave a really good answer last time with Oka Timmy. Uh, so I'll try and go back to what I was saying, and I, uh, I think I started in a very rambling way talking about the fact that actually, on previous games we've worked on, we've been involved in the design, but this time around, we've actually really done the design and been involved in, in it from start to finish. Uh, because our, our background is mainly art, so one of the kind of learning curves for me, particularly in, in making a, a game that a lot of the game mechanics revolve around solving puzzles was the fact that once you design a puzzle, you intrinsically know what the solution is. So then being able to test whether that is easy or too hard is pretty tough. So what we did with the team to get around that was to kind of essentially work in silence uh, in that I or someone else making a puzzle would create it get it working and then push it out to the rest of the team without actually telling them what the solution was. And this allowed us to be able to get their feedback and, and get a sense of whether it was really frustrating or whether it was clear and, and that kind of stuff. So that was, was a way we cope with that on, on the micro level. Um, in terms of the macro level for the game, because it's a narrative game, actually play testing that within a small team because the game length is it's pretty big now. It's about 10 or 15 hours playthrough. That has been a challenge in some ways uh, because obviously we can't afford the time. Well, it's not obvious. I'll tell you, we can't afford the time to play through the game, you know, every week or so because we wouldn't get any kind of content work done. So there's a few things we've done instead. Firstly, it was very clear to us that the, the, the setup and the start of the game is super important. So we basically created a play test that was the first couple of hours. Once we got to a certain level of quality, we created a play test build that we sent out to kind of friends and ex-colleagues and a, a wider audience where we were able to ask very specific questions about the characters and the story and the gameplay as well and puzzles and basically make sure we were setting up the game properly or, or how we envisioned it. So, you know, make sure that the brother wasn't super annoying and that you liked him, but also that there was some obvious tension between him and uh, him and his big sister Tuve, who you play as because she kind of just wants a normal life because she has to look after him too much. Um, 
but equally we wanted to make sure she didn't come across as overly harsh and so that, like these subtle things so that was a very clear way of, of solving that problem in terms of the game beyond that to kind of its full conclusion the way we cope with that is to actually again instead of testing it all the time was have periods throughout production where we stop and go okay now we're going to test it and play it through and see how it feels um and we've kind of done that repeatedly so what we've ended up doing is is a part different passes on the dialogue uh as we've gone along so we kind of got a lot of dialogue in throughout the whole game to start with so that we could go from start to finish and then we've kind of iteratively polished on that to make sure that the story is clear to the player and actually doing that at, at different milestones has meant that the so we talked about in our previous talk about holistic storytelling that all the other elements that are in there as well because it's not just about the text and dialogue it's kind of everything so we need to see that all coming together and then we can kind of check that off against what our original goals were um so our kind of most recent pass has been about just making some aspects of the story a bit clearer to the player and and uh actually listening to feedback from other people who are playing it for the first time because we know what's supposed to happen in the story so i think there's a danger you can be kind of too subtle with things and we've actually gone back and just made certain bits a bit more obvious so that's kind of how we've coped with it um i think we you know for the next title i think we'll probably do it in a slightly more streamlined way we've learned as we've gone along but i think we've found a process that works for us now yeah, but it's a it's a really good question. It's a really uh, challenging thing. So I think that obviously when you're working on something, there's a danger you, you get very close to it, right? So you, you even that you have an in, you have an in, a really thorough understanding of what this is. So it's very hard to judge like someone who's coming at it cold without any of that knowledge will be able to get what you're getting. Um, and one thing, yeah, like get, getting other people to play it or having big breaks from it is the only real way to do that. Otherwise, it's very hard to look at it objectively. Um, but yeah, I think plan plan for iterations. Basically, like I think that's the, probably the best thing to do. You're, you're going to need to do iterations on things. Uh, I think it'd be uh, unless yeah, might be some genius somewhere who can get things judge and get things spot on the first time. But I think definitely um, doing a pass, getting feedback on it. Um, yeah, and just, I think also it's really important to be out, being really open to that that feedback, not being too precious about things. I was literally about to say I think that was one of the things we, we've had the benefit of learning from our time at, at Sony and kind of the, one of the mantras we ended up with was like the notion of, of failing fast and actually viewing things that are wrong or you know perhaps don't go in the way that was intended as a positive thing rather than wasted work. So it's like, you know, if you have to cut something or change something, that's okay. And that's kind of good because it means you're getting closer to the thing you want it to be. Sometimes finding out what something shouldn't be is as valuable as knowing what it should be. If that makes sense. So I think we've always tried to not be, as Al says, be too precious about things and be, be realistic and go, look, this isn't working. Well, this is a this is better. We should do this instead. And we've kind of done that repeatedly throughout the project. And it's probably meant that, you know, every one of us has had to take a hit on some of their work kind of getting cut or, or, or being changed. Um, but the end result is you, you you create something a lot stronger. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully um, that's helped to answer your question, uh, Machine Boy. And we played your game. It's really good. Um, uh, okay, so I'll take this one. Uh, from... do, you, do, you want to, do you want me to ask it for you? Should we do it properly? Do you have? Do you know what it is? Is it abandoned sheep? No. Oh. We can ask me that one if you want. Go on. I've messed up everything now. No, Thought no, I was being no, slick. No. Alex. Yes. Do you have any tips on how to write for multiple characters, be it dialogue or diary entry style written words, and maintain distinct character voices? Uh, no. Also, <laughs> there you go. No, is that no, what you no. do? What do we do so? Um. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the things that we did is I think you basically got to try and understand who your characters are and get a good uh and get a good yeah, just get a really clear idea of of who they are and what the characters are and what their what their traits are and try and build that up. We almost like a dossier. So we had these little fact files about the various characters of things they liked and things they didn't like. So basically when you you know when it 
it's, it's about re making sure you uh, maintain who they are as a character and don't drift back into into like us um but actually you know obviously we have two really talented writers involved in the project as well as well as sam is involved in in narrative design so we've got um danny who's worked on quite a few games harold halbert um he's working on, on backbone now uh abandoned ship and uh emma uh bb who's worked in on the doctor who comics on 2000 ad um so there's it's, they, they they've kind of uh taken over maintaining the the voice of tube and the characters and i was like checking if it's something that sounds like something they would say uh, but i think it is really important especially uh obviously we've got prose writers involved i think when we've been putting in like place or dialogue ourselves it probably is easier to drift back into like writing as as yourself but then i imagine we are putting a certain amount of ourselves into the characters i have the maturity of a seven-year-old boy so you know that's uh that can go into the into the game um yeah, yeah. my top my top tip would be <laughs> learning learning from experience now in this game is if you are filling the dialogue and it amuses yourself to make it slightly bluer than it should be i.e a bit swearier it's probably not a good idea because you may end up having to use that that dialogue my stay in accidentally when you show <laughs> publisher or something uh, so that was probably my mistake early on as fun as it was at the time being exceptionally swear um that did actually happen didn't it yeah yeah that's why it's good advice <laughs> um the other going back to like the more, more more serious answer and you mentioned it i think something that's really helped in in the closing stages of the project is as you said like sam who works for us uh has taken on kind of ownership of the narrative and the dialogue and getting that all throughout through localization but also ensuring that there's a consistency of voice across all the characters and she's basically become like super familiar with it all so has been able to go actually this bit doesn't really feel right with how the characters have evolved and it's like it's, the, it's a three-year project as well so their voice has progressed over time so i think that's been a kind of definite win for us is, is having someone with kind of distinct ownership of that um and it's meant yeah that i think we've kind of managed to avoid slightly um muddy areas where perhaps you know we, we've lost the way of it because she's kind of called them out and we've rewritten it I think that comes again back to the point about playtesting comes back to some of the iteration and stuff as well like we have caught bits where we're like that doesn't sound like her right that doesn't sound like something she'd say um and so again it's you know, probably very hard to get right the first time um so yeah having iteration and stuff but uh, tom says like having sam hi sam as a, a kind of gatekeeping some of that that stuff and um it's been really handy so, but yeah we all play the game like oh that does that just doesn't sound like something that they would say it sounds really out of character or it sounds too harsh so you do pick up all things all the time um i'm guessing it's just being vigilant right you don't you characters will evolve but it's being doing play tests and being vigilant and going like what is that is that does that sound true for the character but i think in order to be able to know whether it sounds true you have to have a very strong idea of what the character is to start off with um and it might be you know as tom says that the ideas of who the characters are will evolve over time i think that's perfectly natural i think at some point they will crystallize you know they might turn out the character might you know, as you're making the game might evolve into something that quite different from how they were at the start uh, but i imagine some, that at some point they will crystallize they'll have to and, uh, and it might be you go okay well, we want to distance this character away from this character to make the more contrast within the cast of the game um but then at some point you will have the idea of, of of what their voice is and yeah you, you basically you're playing the game the game's quite big it's got over thirty-eight thousand words so you'll want to be able to you'll you know you'll be able to check and and catch any outlying lines that feel weird as you're as you're going uh, but that's a really good question there was a second part to the question oh, yeah? the best bit yeah Sorry. Uh, that was just that was just uh, a warm-up for the proper question oh, which is yeah. uh which is which is the tallest character in Rookie? the tallest tallest yeah uh well i'm guessing it is rookie he's massive he's like a great big giant furry furry monster um well there are some other great big giant furry monsters in the game. Say, have you done this side by side no i haven't actually well also they're kind of like quadrupeds not really giving too much away so 
<laughs> yeah, and like Rookie can kind of rear up. So I still think that he is the tallest though. He is. I mean, at some points, we'll, you've shared footage already of great big hairy monster hand coming through the window and like and breaking stuff. He is pretty huge. So it is him. And for people who don't know, uh, the game is called Rookie. Uh, and like the film Jaws, uh, our game is named after the monster. So, uh, but Rookie's not all bad. He's quite a uh, tragic creature, but he is. If you've seen any of our trailers, he is the, um, the great big hairy creature with, with glowing eyes and a killer smile uh, who you see right at the end. The game is named after him and he's intrinsic, central to the, the plot, really, of what's, of what's going on. But he is in the top trumps of Rookie. Rookie is the, the tallest, tallest character. Hey, I've got a good question. Was Dude. it always called Rookie? No, and you know damn well it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we knew we wanted to have, uh, we wanted the name of the game to be a kind of a made a made up word and to be the name of of the monster. Um, and as Tom and helpfully pointed out, the, the uh, we went through like a few different iterations of the name, and we uh, and we basically road tested quite a lot of them by our Scandinavian friends. Uh, who have suffered quite a lot of <laughs> like loads of different names being thrown at them, but like the first one, I think one of the first ones, one that we were quite attached to, I think basically translated or it sounded to Scandinavian ears to to basically be like a pile of crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that one we kind of went. We were really mm. excited about it. We we thought that it sounded it. it sounded yeah exactly. We thought it sounded great, and. Um, but yeah, to to Scandinavian ears, it didn't sound so hot. I think another one as well may have been the name of a fraggle or a muppet. So uh, th we had a few, and um, and like anything, like naming the studio, it's so hard uh, to 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 get the name. And yeah, we spent ages pacing around the the lounge, which you can see Tom's in now, thinking of names for the studio. It's practically Im impossible. I think I've got another question, Alex. Have oh. you ever got the studio name wrong by accident? Never, never got the name wrong. So what Tom is a uh, oh man, I'm really, really getting it in the neck. So when we we went, we were invited to go and show the game at DreamHack in Sweden, at, uh, I'm probably saying the name really wrong, but it's John Copping, um, and uh, yeah, we our flight had been delayed from E3. Uh, and then we had to drive from Stockholm to the the venue, which was six seven hours away. And um, also, it was graduation day in Stockholm, so we were stuck in traffic getting out of out of out of there for a while. And um, so we got there, and we set up to do the show, and it was great. We had really it was really fun showing the game to uh, uh, like Swedish people. So the game is set in a fictional Scandinavian country so it's important that people weren't horrified by it we have tried to um you know make something that's very much our own creation but uh, has a strong sense of place but yeah we had to do a, a stage presentation basically about the game at dreamhack which is quite a big event and i we i came out and we were all prepared and all the videos set up everything was looking cool and um and basically i came out and said Hi, I'm Alex. This is Tom. We're from Polygon Shoe House. At which point, that was too much for Tom to handle, and he just lost it. Which is really can't. helpful. Thanks, Tom. It's my favourite memory ever. Oh, anyway, sorry. We should get back to proper proper questions. Yeah. So actually, I have one here uh, on in the chat from Goldie. Let's see. I think I can see the first part of it. On my phone, it's not not the best. Uh, so, what's the one design solution to a problem which you're the most proud of? Maybe it's the most innovative. Um, I'm just going to type a thing so I can see if I can see the uh, rest of the answer. So, yes, yeah, the design solution you're most proud of. Let me to read it. Maybe it's the most innovative solution, or perhaps it was the answer to a long-standing issue which was finally solved. It could be art, sound, story, anything. Hmm. I think from a from like a um from an art point of view so the whole art style and how it's allowed us to make quite a big world with lots of creatures and lots of 
of scenes with quite a small team. I think that's the solution that I'm really proud of because it's basically I think it's made the game uh, achievable. Really, and it allows basically if you don't know, Rookie is uh, all in 3D, but it has these unlit flat shaders, which basically means you can do loads of neat, interesting stuff and take a massive amount of shortcuts. So we can all the skinning on our characters is not blow my own trumpet good because <laughs> it's really challenging to maintain stuff like shoulder volume on 3d characters but because all our characters are unlit we're able to like un inset intersect bits so we always maintain like really good volume around the shoulders it also allows us with a lot of the monsters to stage stuff as almost like shadow puppets actually i'll be going through some examples of, of that stuff tomorrow in the squishy characters stream that i'll be doing uh, tomorrow afternoon um but yeah so that that as a creative solution to like how are we gonna how are we gonna do this uh yeah I, I really like i think it's something i'm really keen to be using again that that art style it allows to work very quickly it allows the work to be fun it's really fun to work in that style so i think that's the that's the the, the solution that i'm really proud of how about you tom <laughs> good question um I've had longer to think about it, so I've got, I've got two answers, one for art and one for design. So art, as you'll see from a lot of the trailers and screenshots, I mean, it's, it's set in the ancient wilderness, the game, so there's lots of trees. And we started off, I started off by, I was like, I can be clever and I can just always just show the trunk of the tree and never have to show any leaves. And like, that's easy. And the tops can just be off camera. And that, worked quite well for a bit until it was like, this is getting a bit samey and you can't really, it becomes quite hard to block the player. And I, I'd start to need things to keep the player on certain routes and paths. So I was like, I'm going to have to, basically going to have to make a snowy tree, which is more challenging than, than well, I knew it was going to be challenging. That's why I put it off. Um, <laughs> And then particularly with our kind of style to do it in a low poly way, but that felt that it had volume, but it could be lit and have kind of an interesting shape. So I was pleased at the end result of that. And you hopefully you can see that in the, in the screenshots. I think they look, look pretty good. Um, don't just don't burst my bubble and, and say they're rubbish. Um, so the design solution, I think that I'm kind of most pleased of, and we talked about this in the, in the storytelling chat was, um, Part of our uh, the, the way we allow the player to explore Tuve's past and, and what's happened to her is that she kind of actively visits her memories and, and you play through them to see what the actual memory is. They kind of start off as slightly distorted versions or she can't quite remember them properly and your action through those memories help her to see it clearly. So finding solutions to that, that 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 worked within the game mechanics of of Reiki, so that it's essentially kind of puzzle solving and picking up objects and combining them and doing that in a way that was kind of challenging but made sense in the settings for her memories. I'm very pleased with how they've all turned out, and there's like there's kind of four of them in total, like these really key memory sequences, uh, and they're all quite bespoke in their own way and actually they're quite fun to do because they're because they're slightly dreamlike we can be a bit more creative in in how the world looks and how what our objects are doing and play with size and scale more uh so i think they were they were really good and shout out to my friend john who suggested doing it in the first place actually probably a long time ago now but uh that was very good advice so yeah i'm really pleased with that thanks john yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> that sounded sarcastic. Seriously, thanks. No, no, it's good. It's really good. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here's a question from uh, Mr. Krimari from Twitter. And it's, are you going to release uh, on more than on more platforms, maybe Switch? And also, how many languages? Um, okay, so... Yes, we are going to be releasing. Obviously, we're talking Steam at the moment. Uh, we're launching on Switch, Nintendo Switch, and on Steam. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get picked by Nintendo to be part of their Indie World 
stream at Gamescom. Um, so the game's been, you know, is 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 running on the Switch. It's cool, and it's a console. We feel it's a really, really good fit to the game. So those are the two platforms that we're focused on um, for launch. In terms of uh, languages, yeah. So the game is going to be in, in multiple languages. So we talked about before. There was, I think, it's over thirty-eight thousand words, and we're basically doing efig. So it's English. French, Italian, <laughs> German, Spanish. That's efig. That's all those. And then, uh, yeah. so we're also doing uh, Russian, Polish, Portuguese, um, and then Brazilian Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese, and also doing uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. I believe. I think we're doing traditional and simplified Chinese. Could be wrong. I think that's all of them. Does that sound like all of them? It's like a memory game. My yeah. Brain's, my brain's like mush. We're doing a lot. That was going to be my answer. Yeah, but there actually yeah. is is lots. Um, and uh, but we're really pleased. We just didn't like finish doing an overall on some of the UI box stuff and all the text in the game's looking really nice and and, and crispy. And it, it'd be obviously nice. I'm sure now yeah, it'd be nice to be able to do even more languages. Um, but yeah, for our first title, we're we're just really chuffed to be able to uh, to do so many uh, up front. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully, that's answered your questions. Thank you very much for that one. And uh, just if you're just tuning in now, if people have questions, we we have some in advance. But if you have questions, just drop them in the chat, and Tom will will grab them. And uh, we've got some already from social media, which we'll carry on going through now. Okay, so uh, here's one uh, from Lalolana, and is asking, are there going to be conversations in the game? Uh, I think it's talking, I'm uh, guessing, talking about... Um, like branching conversations. Maybe branching conversations. And interestingly, uh, we don't really basically all the conversation when we were looking at how we want to update like adventure games and when we started making the game and just how it healed we re we realized after we were making the game for a little while um and uh, we realized we'd not put any dialogue trees in the game and we weren't really missing them and what we were doing is we were looking at context stuff so the conversations um changing by context so that was one thing with dialogue trees we didn't really like is that you know, people were going through and exhausting uh the options and it could become a little bit mechanical possibly um and so we found that actually we wanted to have the variety in the conversations that you were having and then to be varied but we wanted to it to be more controlled by the context of where you were at in the game or what you were doing or how many visits you'd had to to that character so excuse me we do we do have all the, a lot of variety in there we just chose to make it context-based it also makes the game feel a little bit more alive like the game is in, in is is real and the characters are reacting to you rather than you know going through it, the same same thing so yeah our, 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 the, there are loads of conversations in the game um but all the kind of uh the conversations you have a, a context based on your other actions in the game. Anything to add on that one, Tom? Not really. I mean, I think we kind of so we we did have them originally, and we reached kind of a tipping point. Where it was like we have some, but not loads. Do we want? It, so we we had to essentially choose like, do we need to create more to validate why we have them? Or do we streamline it and actually try and do it in a different way whilst having the same content? And actually just creating more for the kind of sake of it didn't feel like a very good reason to do it. Uh, so we went the other way and, and, and trying to find a different approach. Um, yep. So yeah, it's, it's, sorry to say, it's not because we kind of intrinsically dislike them or whatever. It was just it, it didn't actually feel entirely necessary for the type of story and game we wanted to make. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is that actually is you know is, um, I, I quite enjoy the dialogue fees and dialogue choices in games. It just felt that actually it wasn't really a fit for the partly you know the atmospheric roaming around game that we were making. They kind of felt like they got in a way, and actually it felt uh, that the world was more reactive. 
if we made stuff context based so that was the that was the call we made um yeah so i think um did it, did it, did it, okay so we've got another question from uh goldie was i think earl on your art mood boards good one for you and um who else has been a style influence on you for Rurki and generally that's a good question yeah no his that's amazing so yes big fat yes it's like if you google graphical snow <laughs> trees it will be like his his stuff um i think his particularly because his use of contrast uh and palettes like there's a, a lot of stuff i took from that without wanting directly to not copy it but you'd be too close to it and i you know you look at something like banner saga which very directly took him as an influence as well uh so i was kind of mindful of, of not going too far into that space but certainly like when i talk about the dreaded snowy trees and stuff looking at how he approached that with with kind of big shapes and graphical lines was was definitely something i looked at so he was a he was a really good one um I think kind of more generally another influence was like uh hopper and his his paintings and stuff and use of light and dark one of the things i found going along with generally when i have done an environment and find it's not working very well it'll be because there isn't a strong light source and it's like basically as time's gone on it's it's one of the best ways of making a scene come to life particularly with our art style because it's so graphical and kind of color based if you can have two opposing colors whether it's kind of warm and cold or it's even just the the kind of got contrast it really makes the scene pop far more um because otherwise you can end up with a lot of similar looking shades which are kind of can be okay in, in kind of smaller environments but in bigger ones it just it starts to blend into one um so that was another thing actually so kind of recently in the polish past a lot of things i've been doing is like okay i'm just gonna it might be in a cave but i'm gonna make up a, a light source or bust through to the sky or something so i can have a a, a real bit of contrast and, and make the scene far more interesting give it depth so i'm guessing uh like who in terms of who else has been a style influence on us obviously the movements is a big influence on uh the game um and it took for me like in terms of the cleanness because we've, we've come from doing like more photo real stuff and it was really nice to go back and explore some you know flat shaded uh really clean uh graphics so in terms of, like you know shape and and silhouette it's really important like i, I, I grew up reading uh tintin and there's a certain kind of economy of art style with those which um i imagine has influenced me in the character work in in rookie but then also in some of the big beasties and stuff the ghibli stuff is is yeah is a real is a real is a real influence like mononoke is my favorite uh film and probably channeling uh you know quite a lot of that um but yeah i think the art style is really interesting it basically it really allow it really forces you to look at um at shape and silhouette of your characters which is really good practice anyway, even if you're not doing a flat shade art style. But I think um, it's almost like the ultimate reduction for us because there's, you know, there's nowhere to hide that stuff. The color schemes have to be great. The silhouette has to be good. Everything has to really, really pop. There's nowhere to hide. And it's, but it's great. It's, I really I really find that um, a fun, fun way to work. So Hergé's work and Ghibli stuff for me is a really, yeah, really, um, a really, a really big influence. In terms of like, uh, I guess design wise we talked in the holistic storytelling panel about uh archaeological storytelling and I, I really like playing the from software games. Um obviously they're kind of very different atmosphere and tone to what we're doing visually as well. But they can be further apart. But that uh, that getting dropped into a strange place you've got no idea what's going on. There's some freaky stuff going on. Um and gradually throughout the game uh just gleaning bits of information to myself i get to the end of the game i've still got no idea what's going on but the, there's a sense of a of a bigger a bigger whole that i just find yeah really uh really exciting how about you tom any other influences outside of you know whether for rookie of the game have you covered all yours already 
I think it's it's hard in a way. Like I think you kind of end up being a bit of a sponge to everything. Like I read a lot, and you know we're fortunate that we're similar ages, so have a lot of kind of cultural references as well. Uh, like we, you know, we've done blogs on like eighties movies and stuff, and you know, one of the games that I played when I was young that like made a really big impact on me. It still stands up today. I think it was flashback, and it kind of really stood out to me because of just how amazing the animations were and how crisp it was, and everything felt very, particularly in the first level. Perhaps not so much when you go into the kind of city, um, but that the it felt really vibrant and it it really stood out from the pack. And I remember just playing it and being like, well, "This is the most amazing game I've ever seen." Um, and you know, as a something to kind of pay homage to, like indirectly, I think those similar tropes. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we both wanted to do something that was quite colourful and epic, and that you know was was very graphical with characters that you could kind of relate to. And um, so I think that lots of things have gone into it. Um, but I'm sure I'll think of some other good answers as soon as we turn off the stream as well. But uh, yeah, another world as well is another great game that actually yeah, you know, yeah. people have made comparisons. Obviously, yeah, because we do have a polygonal graphical art style that's flat shaded. I think there's a certain um, economy of storytelling in another world that's really exciting. And yeah, you know, it really you basically start the game, very brief cutscene, bam, you dump dumped into a lake, a pool, on an alien planet. Off off you go. I find that really. Uh, really exciting way to to, uh, to start a game. It's really something we talked about, actually, reminding because we both read a lot of comics, and actually, I think you, you can always get two kinds of comics, some that where the art is absolutely amazing and can be very detail-heavy, but in some ways can distract from the story, and then others that potentially are better comics, where you then, it almost makes it sound like I'm doing down our art, but where you look at the art and you can maybe look at it by itself and it's objectively not as amazing as stuff with all the bells and whistles but it helps carry the story far more because you can reject on it and it doesn't interfere with with what you're experiencing um and not that we're setting out to like dumb down our art but i think having a style that allows you know you to be in a world that is is pleasing and then that it's an antidote to the kind of slightly darker story and then it's an enjoyable place to be and works well with the kind of ambience and music and that kind of stuff i think that there's similar traits there probably that we, we've taken across cool i think there was another uh question on the steam chat if you can have a look at that tom about uh conversation trees yeah. the follow-up yeah so um yeah fair keys but so happy to hear about the context-based conversation instead of trees good really interesting that space how are you handling the context did you have to build your own tools to manage it alex um not really so we, we use a tool suite anyway that we've kind of um because we're both we are pretty technical i write a lot of our shaders um but we are you know more arty than we are technical so we bought um uh, adventure creator tool suites that we use um heavily in the game we have messed with it quite a lot to bend it to our our needs but it has provided a really good foundation for what we're jumping off point for what we're trying to do so mostly with the uh, the context stuff we basically have like variables in the game that will track whether you've done certain things and then the game will do tests based on those things that you've done um and sometimes those tests can be quite complicated uh, so have you done this but not this have you done, you know have you been here or not you know so that, that so that, that that will provide and also like the number of visits you have to something the the tree the tree of many that you see in the start of the the demo is quite a uh, probably one of our more complicated examples it's almost like a uh oracle brain the brain was fading for a while but yeah it's almost like a an oracle character where you will you can go and talk to it at various points in the game and it will give you um it'll give you advice or uh or like you know feed some uh story to to you or you know uncover a different layer based on what you're doing so that's quite a complicated one to keep track of i know sam's done a 
matches in wrestling with with that one but yeah, that's generally how we do it is we'll keep track of things that the player has, has done whether that's characters they've met things that they've done or stuff that they've seen and that will inform uh the conversation you have when you get back to people um and also we just try and we do try and do a lot of stuff with with dialogue variants as well so that we'll have we find if there's a you know something like nothing quickly reveals it's the same with the audio stuff nothing makes itself appear fake reveals itself to be fake quicker than the repetition uh, and so like having if there's like interactions with things like having uh you know having some variants there so it's not just repeating the same the same thing if if people are trying to you know, re-engage with the conversation again that's been really good and that's really true for the audio as well so with the emotion like library system that we have the emote library system that we have uh so basically we have like 40 but 40 plus emotions for each different character and uh basically we tag a dialogue line with them and that's kind of cool because we can change the emote independently of the dialogue line so we could have a line and like two ways emote could sound like grumpy or confused or puzzled or surprised or scared um, but then we can actually go okay well actually that moat doesn't seem to fit with that line so let's tweak it let's try and maybe not make it the obvious one maybe make the the emotes kind of contrary to the line it gives a bit more subtlety to the performance um that's really good as well but again with um, the emotes so for example if you're examining in the, the streaming video we'll put back on a bit later you'll see you can examine objects in your inventory and see you know uh get a bit more information about them and generally that so the, the player could just press it again and and it could be examining the object again so one of the things we added in is we have like four or five different variants of each emote and we you know, they're not like huge audio files because they're quite short things like huh? 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 Or, you know, i'm not an actor that's why i'm not in the game <laughs> <But> the <laughs> um, disclaimer but yeah exactly um but the um but actually just having subtle variants in the emote sounds that when they play back to back and it doesn't yeah if, if as long as they're not back to back they're like one off it's it's totally fine and that's really um yeah i think it's just those it's those little touches of things that you, that, you know getting away from like immediate repetition that really kind of reveals takes you out of being in a fairy tale world so i think it's those little touches we've tried to be quite careful to uh to to track and to solve so yeah good answer yeah i think that's um yeah i think that kind of uh covers it and the, the emote library system is really interesting we've we've been using all uh yeah uh yeah um oh great thanks ricky uh, they agree with the repetition yeah no it's a really it's a really interesting one to to solve but the, the human is like quite sophisticated like it can re if you it, it can hear if there's something that's exact the exact thing back to back it can it just picks it up straight away so we just try and um uh sidestep that um again again but uh, going back to the, the talk the audio that 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 emote system was something we were playing around with from the very start because we were like we did some tests with uh we did a number of tests we did one which was like fully voiced lines um which we got some test recordings in and they were really good we were just so nervous about getting it wrong and also with the uh with the volume of text that we have in the game uh it will be like really it probably would have like doubled the budget for the game um it would have been an absolute nightmare and yeah we're also we've uh, have you working in this way i feel like not to pat ourselves on the back too much um but we've i think we've for us and our skill set i think we've made the best choice because it allows us to um have the like the performance and the emotive sound uh and have a wide range of emotions we can play with it also has meant we've been able to still be editing the script quite late on like we've just come back from our second round of of, of loke stuff so now the script is locked uh, but we but because we hadn't recorded like vo lines we were able to tweak and finesse and iterate on the script like right until the, the last minute and you know because the emote sits separately the audio sits separately and we can just apply them to different line, lines 
that's allowed us a great deal of flexibility to be able to tweak things, which has been really, really, really handy. I think if we recorded, uh, committed, and recorded to a load of VO, got it in, you now saw how it how it felt. Um, you know, we would we would kind of wouldn't would be locked in. We wouldn't be able to change and iterate on the dialogue line. So, I think for us, I think if we'd had obviously we're from an art background if we'd had more of a grounding in in like audio and voice recording then obviously that's a very different story so i've got some friends at salix games who've got like great deal of expertise and that kind of thing and they're super confident with and amazing at and that's we're we're you know we're uh, we're not them so we've got to kind of play um to our our strengths and make the best choices that be having that flexibility there <coughs> to be able to iterate on stuff and to the end um yeah, it was really important, really important. Agreed. It was a good decision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Right, I think we may be um uh we may be out of questions. So um we'll just carry on talking for a little bit. If anyone wants to boot any questions, I'll go and check Twitter as well, but if anyone wants to boot any questions in the chat, you're more than welcome. If we've exhausted um everyone's questions then by by all means we will um we will call it i'll give you a question yeah it's a good question it's not setting you up to reveal an anecdote where you look stupid uh <laughs> which character have you enjoyed making the most oh it's interesting so we, we tom sent me some screen grabs of really early footage um it was really interesting because everything looked appalling. <laughs> that is honestly that's the best. Sorry to interject after I immediately just had a thing, but it's like if you ever make a game, the best thing you can do is just keep all the first images and screenshots of videos of the things you do because your game will look so much better. If you're having a dark day, you can look back at what it once was and be like, oh, okay, we have done something good. Yeah, no, it's really. I think there's been a few moments where I've gone, ah, oh, actually, I've forgotten that it's. Pretty good. <laughs> so, but the one of the really interesting things looking back at those early things is like Tuve hasn't changed. Right? She's not changed at all since the um, like we did a pass on her, and she stayed the same. Uh, and I think we did probably take a decent chunk of time to make sure that she was right. I haven't gone and added anything in. Like everything, we had to like go and fix a few bits and pieces. But um, when we did like Unity updates and things, but the uh, but like all the bits have been there from the first pass she hasn't had another pass we've added in animations and layers of sophistication to performance and yeah maybe some stuff to our animation network like um we've added in layers like leaning and banking when when she's she's running but she heard like her character hasn't she but i think we kind of um yeah so that's kind of really chuffed with that it's kind of remarkable that we haven't felt the need to go back to her uh, and revisit her or tweak her. So I think that's that's been um, it's been nice. I'm glad that she stood the the, the her design stood the test of test of time. In terms of like the characters that I like to work on, like the what we always try and do with the game is is add as well as like designing the character for a, from a visual point of view, also um, design it from an animation point of view as well. I'm a big believer in linked up thinking in terms of character and animation design. So the character should be designed you know with an eye to how they will move and animate and get around the scene so quite a lot of the characters in the game like the, the troll sister characters uh, can roll themselves up into boulders and roll around that's an intrinsic part of you know we considered that when we were doing the concept sketch the tonte characters um almost act like um shark fins they'll have like the like gnome like hats that they will disappear up into but then the, the hats can slide around and they'll they'll pop out of the hat so i think considering uh motion design as as part of the character design like from the off probably come us cover some more of this stuff tomorrow but i think that's really it's really fun i really like that way of working and also like because we're well when we were doing stuff like kill zone 2 i'd spend like three and a half months making a single character and uh whereas now like the lot i think tuve we took two weeks over to make sure we got her really right and most of the characters we make like like much much quicker um and that's the same of... with the locomotion as well right that actually being able to roll the troll around or 
move the hat around for the Tom Day is, is much more efficient and actually looks far more interesting as well. It's like a double win. Yeah, it's much more efficient and it looks more interesting and also it's less frustrating when you're playing the game because you're not waiting ages for someone to play a turn animation then like trot off down the road. Yeah, and it's basically they, they can go dunk brrr, or like, you know, whoot, whoot. you know, it's just really economical movement doesn't get in the way of, of people playing the game. So we do that quite a lot actually yeah so we do that quite a lot and it's fun uh, and i do really like that way of working in terms of like what the which ones i've enjoyed animating the most uh i do oh i do like the uh the so in the trailer you'll see like there's a shot of tuve running up a uh, out of the clouds running up a, an ancient staircase to a um to a wolf sitting on a a big in the top of a great big mountain and that's one of the Jotun guardians that we have in the game there's a number of them uh, i think we've shown that one we've also shown a, a raven on our social media channels which looks quite cool i just really like those there's just so much how we we built we kind of build them almost like shadow puppets they are very quick to make they are very staged and built to cameras but we are able to have lots of uh undulating uh, that has like the wind rippling through it that adds a um, great deal of sophistication to stuff and they're, they're just like when stuff is <coughs> really quick and this stuff has a great big sense of scale it's just really fun to do I love that stuff I generally now still now after after three years still really enjoy working on the game and like it's really nice sometimes on a Monday morning just in play in the editor and hearing the sounds of the forest and just running around and making snow trails um, and uh, I think that's quite a good sign after three years because sometimes you've finished making a game and you can't you can't stand to look at it. So <laughs> I think it's um, it's really good. It's really good that um, still a place that I really like to, to visit and characters are still like to animate. So, yeah, good. Strong, positive. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it's just really um, yeah, it's cool. All right. Well, I think that's been getting on on for uh, almost an hour after our after our full start. So I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so we will leave it there. What I will say is, um, we have now we're all set for streaming. We're probably going to do some more stuff. I'm going to jump on tomorrow at smooth uh, at nine a.m. PT, which is five p.m. UK time or six p.m. Uh, European time to talk about characters and I'll go through some of the stuff we do for characters um, and just how we make them feel uh, tactile and their design <coughs> uh, and stuff like that. Um, if you want to know more about the game, obviously if you're excited by what you've seen and heard, feel free to wishlist it. That's a big win uh, for us. We're very grateful. And you can follow us on on Twitter at at Poly Treehouse, and also check out United Label Games. They're our publisher who we've been collaborating with on Rookie, and they've been uh, uh, been awesome. So check them out. They've got some other great games as well. Uh, so we'll sign off there, and we'll put the the gameplay loop back up. But thanks for thanks for stopping by, everyone. It's been really cool. And um, yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>